thank you. Um, yeah, I was told to do something light and fun, and um, <laughs> I didn't quite get how I ended up doing this, but um, yeah. So I think one of the, um, the key things about any kind of healthy human relationship <laughs> is that you can challenge and question it and feel free to do that in dialogue. And I find it very interesting that um, we have many examples in the Hebrew Bible um, of prophets um, arguing with God and um, in different ways. Um, so uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are uh, with the content of the Torah, um, but uh, you probably heard of um, the example where Abraham um, is arguing with God, um, saying if, if you can find uh, 50 righteous people in um, uh, Sodom, w w will you not destroy the city? And he actually bargains with God and he gets it down to 10. And unfortunately, 10 righteous people apparently can't be found. Um, so that doesn't really work ultimately. But um, I think it's, uh, it's not only interesting that he feels empowered to do that, but it's interesting that uh, he says, um, and I'll just I'll read the English translation, um, far be it from you, uh, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And so he's actually um, holding God to the standards that he has learned are right and proper um, and not uh, just uh, viewing God as a sort of external authority um, and, you know, you should do what, what I say because I say so sort of vain. Um, but he's actually pulled out some principles and learnt from that and he's actually reflecting that back to God. Um, in the same way, uh, Moses does uh, much the same thing when God decides to uh, destroy the entire Jewish people that he's just um, helped save from, from the Egyptians and they're uh, sort of wending their way towards the, the promised land, Eretz Israel. Um, and um, uh, Moses says, well, uh, you know, what are people going to say? Uh, that this uh, figure has has saved you uh, saved the Jewish people only to kill them off in the mountains and annihilate them. Um, this is not uh, particularly a good idea. Blah blah blah. Uh, just <laughs> paraphrasing the Bible. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, and God, you know, he's like, all right, yeah, um, I've changed my mind. Um, he renounced the punishment he had planned to bring upon his people. Um, so he actually changes his plan. And I think uh, that's that's a really great relationship that Moses is having with God because, um, you know, God is finding it a really interesting experience, like a learning experience, which is, that sounds a bit heretical, but I think, um, you know, no man is an island and to every everyone exists in dialogue. And I think it's positive to see God as being part of that. Um, and actually, you know, if we need God, God needs us as well. Um, and that uh, that's sort of what, what I would learn from that. Um, sometimes uh, some of these interactions with God that the prophets are having um, don't seem to be as positive. And uh, on the face of it, uh, a, a bit earlier, to backtrack, um, Moses is uh, having a, a bit of a fit of insecurity um, which seems to partly revolve around the fact that he has what looks like a speech impediment. It says, I mean, the Hebrew is chaved pe u chaved lashon, which is like literally I'm heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue. Um, so, uh, and um, he basically says, uh, well, I've never, he says, I've never been a man of words. Um, and, you know, I have this speech impediment. And, um, and God says, well, I made you like that. So, you know, what are you talking about, kind of? Um, <laughs> and then um, Moses says, well, please go and make someone else your agent. Don't make, don't make me the prophet. Um, and uh, God gets quite angry with him. Um, and he says, well, you know, your brother Aaron, um, he's, he's a great speaker. Um, he's, he's a very smooth talker. And, um, yeah, so why don't we, you, you shall speak to him, and uh, you can be as, as God is to you, to him, as God, yeah. And um, I'll be with you, um, and um, he shall speak for you to the people, serve as your spokesman. And, um, but, you know, the channel from God is actually Moses. And I think um, the positive thing about that is that um, 
we can learn a lot from God's reasoning. And if Moses had just accepted it and felt really insecure and unable to kind of uh, fulfill that role, um, he he perhaps wouldn't have grown into himself as he does throughout his life um, in in the Bible. And um, I think, um, you know, the fact that he needs it explained to him why actually, you know, he's got the content and he's got the spiritual connection and the right kind of morals and values and so on. Uh, but Aaron is is a smooth talker and that's something else. And actually that's kind of less important. Um, th- basically, we, we learn a lot from that interaction. Um, and not only does it reassure him, but um, uh, yeah, it sort of resolves a lot of those issues. Um, yeah, the next example is, um, I'm going to read it out because there's been a lot made of this, d- different interpretations. Um, it's quite mysterious. Um, so uh, Jacob wrestles with the angel. Um, probably know this passage. Um, and um, Jacob has uh, basically uh, stolen um, his his brother Esau's blessing um, a bit earlier in his life. And Esau has vowed to kill him. He's very angry about it. Um, actually, interestingly, uh, it's worth noting that um, there are uh, there is the what's called the inner the innermost blessing um, of their father Isaac, um, which is actually the one that Jacob uh, has uh, used deception uh, along with his his mother Rebecca has used deception to obtain instead of Esau by into in uh, imitating Esau, um, and then there's the uh, the sort of ancestral. Uh, blessing that um, uh, they've that has come down from Abraham, um, and actually this has always uh, gone uh, to Jacob. Yeah, to Jacob, um, not Esau, uh, and he he receives that um, uh, from Isaac when he sets off to find a wife. So uh, the innermost blessing is actually it's not um, to inherit Eretz Israel. Um, it's uh it is more about wealth and power and other people bowing down and respecting you and you dominating them uh that's actually the the bit that um jacob has has received that uh isaac intended to give esau and um and then he he wrestles with god in this paragraph i'm going to read um so sort of it's quite interesting with the wording um Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket, so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But he answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, what is your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with beings divine and human and have prevailed. Uh, Jacob asked, pray tell me your name. But he said, you must not ask my name. And he took leave of him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, meaning I have seen a divine being face to face and my life has been preserved. Um, And then, uh, so interesting thing about that is that um, this is why, you know, the children of Israel, the Jews are actually called uh, Bnei Israel is from uh, the name for Jacob literally the children of Jacob um and uh yeah the, the word Jews it just comes from um the the province that's half of the historical kingdom uh, the of Eretz Israel of the land of Israel so it's kind of less significant whereas um the name Israel it means you know he who has struggled with God so this is kind of a very weird thing to a, a name to to have, I think, and um, uh, I find it it's it, it's not entirely clear. I mean, that whole uh, narrative is pretty mysterious. But um, what happens next is uh, he Jacob reconciles with Esau, and um, he effectively uh, so basically um, he bows down to Esau. And then he gets entire on, his entire entourage to bow down to Esau, um, and then uh, he he sort of 
the interaction is very much around, um, you know, Jacob says, uh, Esau says, oh, I have enough. And Jacob says, you must accept my blessing. I have everything. And I think um, his, you know, his interaction uh, wrestling with God has been quite transformative. And he's perhaps, uh, w w one reading that I find quite powerful of this is that um, he has realized that uh, the blessing to do with the wealth and the power and being bowed down to that he received by deception instead of Esau. Um, it's okay to, in a sense, give it back to him. Um, and he does that and they're reconciled and that's very powerful. And he says, um, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God. And I think um, there's something really profound in that. Um, and uh, whatever has happened to him alone, wrestling with the angel, wrestling with God, uh, that has allowed that that reconciliation to happen, and um, his his uh, his whole outlook has changed. Um, so that's really interesting. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to um, mention isn't actually from the the Bible; it's from the Talmud. Um, all of these people that I've talked about have been prophets, not you know regular people. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a bit of a... Sorry, is my... I think I've lost a piece of paper. Is it? Sorry. Um. Right, I'll just read it out. Um. Oh, dear. On that day, Rabbi Eliezer put forward... Sorry, these, this is a Talmudic uh, debate between different rabbis and... Um, they are trying to convince each other. So Rabbi Eliezer put forward all the arguments in the world, but the sages, the other rabbis, did not accept them. Finally, he said to them, if the halakha, the Jewish law, is according to me, let that carob tree prove it. He pointed to the nearby carob tree, which then moved from its place 100 cubits, and some say 400 cubits. They said to him, one can't bring proof from the moving of carob tree. Said Rabbi Eliezer, if the halakha is according to me, may that stream of water prove it. The stream of water then turned and flowed in the opposite direction. They said to him, one can't bring proof from the behavior of a stream of water. Said Rabbi Eliezer, if the halakha is according to me, may the walls of the house of study prove it. The walls of the house of study began to bend inward. Um, Rabbi Yehoshua then rose up and rebuked the walls of the house of study. If the students of the wise argue with one another in halakha, what right have you to interfere? Uh, in honor of Rabbi Yehoshua, the walls ceased to bend, bend inwards, but in honor of Rabbi Eliezer, they did not straighten up, and they remain bent to this day. Then, said Rabbi Eliezer to the sages, if the halakha is according to me, may a proof come from heaven. Then a heavenly voice went forth and said, what have you to do with Rabbi Eliezer? The halakha is according to him in every place. Then Rabbi Yehoshua rose to his feet and said, it is not in the heavens. What did he mean by quoting this? He's quoted a part of um, the Bible. Um, so what did he mean by quoting this? Said Rabbi Jeremiah, he meant that since the Torah has been given already on Mount Sinai, we do not pay attention to a heavenly voice, for you have written in your Torah, decide according to the majority. Uh, Rabbi Natan met the prophet um, Elijah, he asked him, uh, what was the Holy One, blessed be he, doing in that hour? So they're wondering what God made of all this. And Elijah says, he was laughing and saying, my children have defeated me. My children have defeated me. So, yeah, he's pretty happy about that. Um, why is this important? Well, um, yeah, for one thing, um, in the Jewish tradition, we're not expecting any more prophets, and uh, we don't have that kind of, kind of connection to God, but we do have uh, Jewish texts, and we can study the texts and argue about them and over them, and that is the, uh, the way that we can participate in this tradition. Um, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs>